I guess I need to tell you a little bit more how I met Robert Monroe, the, the founder of the Monroe Institute. This place called the Monroe Institute. I went down to the Monroe Institute and met Mr. Monroe. Now you can't, he lived at this place called the Whistlefield Farm then, which was not where the Monroe Institute's located right now. And I met him in his little screened in porch there. I actually uh, sat on the divan there. No, I sat in the funny uh, chair there, and he was sitting over on the couch on the divan when I met him. And I couldn't say to him, Mr. Monroe, I'm with this secret program where we're going to try to train remote viewers, because it was secret. You can't <laughs> tell him about it, right? But I told him I had read his book. There was only one book at that time, Journeys Out of the Body, and that I was interested in his sound process that was mentioned in this book, the hemisync process, because I had had many childhood experiences about which I was reminded upon reading his book. Well, he persisted on asking me to describe those childhood experiences to him and eventually invited me to go into his laboratory. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And he said, well, the only way, you know, we're going to be able to tell you about this hemisync is for you to find out for yourself. And so he took me into the laboratory. And in his laboratory, we met a receptionist and walked down a hallway where I saw a room with tape recorders and lights and switches in it. And I thought, oh, I'd like to go in there. I'm sort of a gadget kind of a guy. And I thought, I'd like to see what that was all about. But he had a different idea and encouraged me to walk on down the hallway and turn into the next room. The next room simply had a strange bed that was built back into the wall and he told me to lay down in that bed and put on the headphones and I was like a little bit concerned because I was there as a military officer on an official mission and I wasn't about to do anything weird but I asked him what kind of sounds he might play for me and he said very casually oh at first we'll play some music just to relax you and that sounded interesting so I sat on the bed and put the headphones on and then lay down. Well, the minute I laid down, the lights in the room went out and the door closed. And I was a little bit worried because he had said, we'll play music at first. And what did he mean by at first we'll play some music? Well, within a few seconds there was some music. So I was encouraged to think that this man was truthful. He was honest. He said he'd play music. And he did play some music. And after that, the music went away and faded into the sounds of the ocean, surf sounds. And Bob and Roe came on my headphones and said, and here is the sound of surf, a symbol of the power of sound here at the Monroe Institute. And I thought, well, that, that's a commercial announcement, obviously, and I recognize that. And the surf rolled in and rolled out, and it made me feel good. I was raised in California, so this reminded me of my own childhood. And after a while, the surf sort of faded away, but left a kind of rushing or hissing sound and a slow droning sound, a wah, 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 droning sound in the background. And I wondered what that was and where that sound was coming from. And then I began to feel something, a visceral body feeling. The bed began to rise up to the ceiling, and I thought, oh, this bed is special. It's just like when you get your oil changed in the gas station, and they raise the car up in the air. He must be able to raise this bed up in the air in the same way. And I tried to listen to see if I could hear an air compressor running in the background, but I couldn't. And I couldn't figure out how they built this bed. I was uh, quite an analytical kind of person and it was very interesting to me. I wondered how strong it was and maybe someday at my house I could get one of these and I could change my own oil in my car. But this feeling of moving up into the air changed and I began to sense lateral movement, a movement sideways, much like being in an airplane and the pilot says, it's now time for landing, please fasten your seatbelts and you're suddenly aware of the movement of the airplane. It was that same kind of body sensation of movement. And accompanying this movement was a visual perspective of huge boulders or crystals passing by me as, I, as though I was moving through a passageway of some kind. 
But I had a rather silly thought. I thought, I must be inside of a flavor straw. I remember as a kid, you could drink water or milk through a straw and it would flavor it with sugar crystals. And I had this silly notion that I was inside of a flavor straw. And Bob Monroe's voice came over my earphones and said, well, what's happening? And I said, well, I seem to be going someplace. And he said, well, where are you going, kid? And I said, I don't know. This is your place. I don't know where I'm going. After a period of time, I came to what I assumed was the end of this passageway or this flavor straw in my thinking. And I began to poke my head out of the end of the flavor straw. And my entire perspective changed. And I was in a boundless, open, white space watching myself come out of the end of this flavor straw. And it was very meaningful, like, wherever you go, there you are. Which sounds stupid, I know, but at the time, in this state of consciousness, it was, I've come all of this way to find out I'm already here. And this revelation must have led to some sort of an utterance, or, oh, ah, because immediately Mr. Monroe's voice was in my headphones, saying, well, what happened? And I had forgotten all about Mr. Monroe. I was so embarrassed. I was so involved in this journey that I'd forgotten all about him. And in my embarrassment, in my frustration, I just said, oh, well, I'll just have to tell you about this later. This is, this is okay. it's okay, I'll, I'll tell you later. Well, he left me in this white space for I don't know how long, some length of time. I think something must have happened to me there, but I can't remember what it was. The next thing I remember him saying was, it's time for lunch. And I thought about that, and I thought about that. I had no idea what lunch was. And wherever I was in this white space, they don't do lunch there. It didn't make much sense, but that didn't seem to matter because he changed the sounds I was listening to. He lowered the bed back down to the floor again. And before I knew it, he came through the door and the lights were on and I sat up in bed and I was like, what in the world has happened? And I took my headphones off and I leaned down to look under the bed. And he said, what, did you drop your wallet down there or something? And I said, no, I have my wallet, it's okay. And I was puzzled and wondering about what had happened to me and what were these sounds. Well, he was encouraging me to get outside and get out in the sunlight and sort of get grounded, get back to earth, as it were. And then we went on up to lunch. And sitting at lunch, we had to drive about 45 minutes, I guess, to get to a place for lunch. And sitting at lunch, we ordered our meals, and then we were waiting for the meals to come. It's sort of an awkward time when you have to try to make some conversation. And I very innocently turned to him and said, well, Mr. Monroe, when you raised the bed up, and he looked at me and said, I didn't raise the bed up. And I was thinking about that and trying to figure out, well, what, what had happened? And then I slowly, I realized and said, oh, it had taken me about 45 minutes to try to understand, try to comprehend what had happened to me. And then I got very excited. Secretly in the back of my mind, I thought, boy, this would really be good for the remote viewers. But to him, I said, what is the power in those sounds? How did those sounds make that happen? And he kept backing away and he said, no, the sounds didn't make that happen. That was your experience. The sounds only put you in a state of consciousness that we call body asleep, mind awake. And what you did in that state of consciousness was up to you. Well, I didn't know if I believed him so much, but I was very curious about what is it that makes this hemisync work? And when I went back to my military superiors at Fort Meade, I didn't tell them all the things that had happened to me that day. But I did recommend that when our remote viewers became practiced enough in remote viewing, that this may be a form of advanced training for them and subsequently introduced Joe McMahon.